the dry cargo webinar um, covering next generation of fully electric and hybrid systems for dry cargo vessels. Um, this is an all in about efficient and reliable shipping for a sustainable world, which we are going to take you through now here in the coming coming one hour. So next, please. Um, my name is uh, Michael Durby Christensen. I'm a global segment manager for dry cargo vessels uh, on, um, in ABB Marine and Ports. Um, today I will be, uh, my part of the presentation will be about market drivers, current legislations and class uh, requirements. And then I'm happily joined by Ethan Xiong sitting in uh, ABB Shanghai who will talk about um, shaft generator hybrid systems for cargo vessels. And um, third, uh, Martin Nutchila, who's sitting in ABB Finland, a sales manager for dry cargos, who will talk about translocal bulk of vessels and electrical system and acid propulsion in this connection. And then uh, finally, but not least, uh, joined by Sami Kaneva, senior principal engineer, uh, who will talk about uh, carbon-free fuel cell application, uh, ESS battery application, and uh, and things also in a broader hybrid perspective. And in the very end um, of today, after one hour approximately, we will have a Q&A session where everybody is, uh, of course, uh, hopefully free to ask some questions in the Q&A, uh, uh, where you will have a, a, a possibility to ask uh, or to write the questions in as you would like. And also, I would like in this uh, context to thank our marketing department, and that is uh, Jackie Kai Sheng, ABB Shanghai, who is at this very moment conducting this, um, um, who has uh, prepared this uh, seminar and also conducting it today together with Christine Muller sitting in ABB Norway. Next, please. Uh, so, as I said, I, um, let's proceed and start up um, with point one on the agenda, which is about market drivers, current legislation and class requirement. But first, a little bit about ABB. Next. <clears throat> so, ABB, Marine and Ports at a glance. This is um, uh, one of the big divisions in uh, ABB in total. Uh, we have uh, 1,800 uh, employees working in our division and um, and we are of, of course have a global footprint and uh, are represented in 26 countries six local divisions and 20 local business lines um, no doubt um, when we talk about dry cargo vessels and new buildings or activity for dry cargo vessels a lot is centered uh, most of of all is centered around far east for building such vessels meaning in Shanghai uh, or in China, PRC, Singapore, um, Japan and Korea, not the least. Um, <clears throat> AVB is, uh, is the, the marine policy is divided up in five business lines, uh, marine and systems, uh, marine propulsion, Coast Guard and Navy and ports. Uh, that is automation and electrification for ports. And of course, service for both, uh, let's say, main areas, which is ports and, and marine. Marine systems and marine propulsion is, of course, working very closely together in, in, in the cases uh, where we have projects covering, let's say, all of the items we are talking about. A ABB a vision is a basically electrical, digital and connected. Um, our vision um, is not maybe a big, very big surprise, electrification. Um, basically plays a bigger and bigger role when we talk about uh, ships uh, also in dry cargo segment. Of course, primarily now in, on, on, on coastal and, and local um, and feeder vessels are now coming up. We see projects in this context. But uh, of course, ocean going, uh, we talk more about, um, about a hybrid system, which is actually assisting uh, the, the existing propulsion as we see today. But as I said, this is changing. Today, we will not talk so much about digital systems uh, in, in broad sense. Uh, this is definitely not because we are under, underestimating uh, the importance of that uh, from own perspective and from your perspective. But we have decided to, uh, to focus uh, today on electrical and, uh, and the propulsion uh, part of uh, what we are doing. 
And then, of course, connectivity is also a very important part, and that um, will will also come as uh, as a, in a later uh, seminar or webinar we will do. Uh, finally, our values uh, uh, very important, of course, is to to main value is to provide value to our customers, and uh, the core of that is uh, for, to focus on our productivity. Uh, to maintain ourselves uh, competitive, not the least in this dry cargo market, where there is quite, uh, let's say, severe focus on, on CapEx, but uh, also on OPEX, of course. And reliability it is very important for all type of ships that actually you can trust what you actually have underneath your, uh, in your ship. And also not the least efficiency. Efficiency is very important, uh, and that goes hand in hand with sustainability, as we have also mentioned uh, earlier. Next, please. Core business in uh, marine is, uh, as I already pointed out, electrical systems and acipot propulsion um, and automation. Um, AVB actually do have um, a, com a complete uh, assortment or, or comprises of uh, to offer the market, which goes from bridge solutions, uh, digital solution, not to forget automation. Uh, we have actually a full born automation system now available also for dry cargo area. Uh, fuel cell solutions, as I said, acid propulsion, but also a variety of um, medium voltage AC and DC electrical systems. Um, of course, service I've touched upon and the battery solutions also. And and uh, the ship types we are actually attending now, um, maybe not so well known in the past that we were actually so active in the dry cargo area or for merchant vessels, but certainly we have been so now for the remaining four years. Next, please. So um, going more deep into now what we are, let's say, our challenges and uh, also uh, opportunities uh, for you as ship owner and for us as supplier. So um, actually every paper and magazine you are reading at the moment, the subject is about carbon reductions, let's say globally, locally, and in our industries, various industries, including your own. And as we speak at this very moment, there is a meeting uh, finalizing in MAPC in IMO, which uh, discuss uh, the final uh, new regulations as for reducing uh, ship's carbon impact. And as you already are aware of, IMO has a decarbonation targets uh, with 40% uh, at 2030 and targets for 70% reduction by 2050. Some owners are actually even venture to say that uh, they will uh, try to reduce until 100% in 2050. Um, two new regulations, as I just mentioned uh, in APC taking place at the moment is uh, what you is named EEXII, which and the CII vessels to be ready for 1st of January 2023 for approvals. Based on EEDI for new bills, EEXI describes vessels CO2 emissions standardized related to engine power, cargo capacity, and speed. CO2 emissions are calculated based on the installed power, fuel consumption, and the conversion factor. CII is calculated as a ratio between the total mass of CO2 emitted to the total uh, transport work undertaken in a given calendar year. The vessel's performance rating is done by comparing the ship's carbon intensity with the average of other ships of same type. So after 1st of January 2023, vessels must be ready to obtain the IEEC, which is the International Efficiency Certificate, in order to actually operate on the seven seas. These above measures is, uh, measures is regarded or are regarded as some of the most crucial targets ship owners are facing now in order to operate vessels. And that goes in, in, in the sense of uh, or concerning, of course, uh, designing new buildings, but uh, certainly also now for existing vessels sailing. So conclusively, smaller reductions measures will no longer be enough for new buildings and even existing vessels at sea. Significant improvements of fuel consumption and switching to low carbon fuels 
has to be done. Slow steaming, reducing engine loads, implement dual fuel engines is already in force. But optimizing route planning, lowering idle pie periods during anchoring and time in port has also now to have a high focus and take advantage at the same time of the several operational and technical options available already today and tomorrow. Next, please. So, efficiency and reliable shipping for a sustainable world. Sustainability and operational efficiency in our minds goes hand in hand in ABB hybrid solutions. We are there to actually help not only comply with the, the regulations, but also to do our best to secure owner's efficiency is not being lost in this, in this context. Uh, basically, what we also see is that the seaborne industry, transport industry continues to grow. And in certain time, at least up till now, for instance, for container vessels, a need for bigger and more efficient driven vessels is in general um, needed. Um, fuel efficiency and CO2 reductions are in focus, as already discussed. And regulatory changes, however, must be expected from rising from rising public pressure, IOMO and classification. New fuel types and development and emission control in place. As late as yesterday, I was joining a seminar in Copenhagen where actually many bodies or institutions and so on, uh, politicians are discussing all kinds of uh, possible uh, fuels uh, which are expected to be uh, pushed forward. Apart from hydrogen, it is of course uh, methylene and um, methylene and it is uh, of course um, uh, other type of fuels uh, which are being discussed at the moment which will comply with completely uh, co2 uh, free operation <clears throat> we also see um, uh, whether, uh, what, what is called uh, the lng uh, still being um, is being enforced in new buildings and uh, and of course you will have but I understand also 25% reduction on CO2 when you are actually burning LNG fuel. So we are still at that point, but but this is all already giving an indication that the 40% reduction we are looking into at in 2030 seems like the, the owners will be maybe even more, 40 to 60% will be what the owners are able to actually cope for already in 2030. And that is of course, uh, maybe uh, what, I, what one could regard as good news, seen from some state to sustainability and, and, and environmentally uh, point of view, of course, not the least. So, but uh, having said that, uh, then ABB is here actually to, to, to help you in your efforts. And uh, our technology takes you the way further with shaft generator systems, as we will discuss now in a few seconds optimized electrical systems like DC grid and DC link systems in our hardware or in, a, in our uh, control systems. Diesel electric power and propulsion systems, which is uh, one, uh, represents one of some of our core competences. Energy storage and the ship to shore and fuel cells, as we will discuss also. And what we will not touch upon, upon so much today, but still important is of course, digitization and connectivity when operating the vessels. So just for my presentation, just uh, before I hand over the word to, to Ethan, um, next please. Uh, I will just finalize uh, some key message uh, regarding ABB and our, our presence in the dry cargo vessel segment. So ABB portfolio comprises electrification, propulsion and automation. We are focusing on being competitive, on having a per capex that's relevant for this market. We are focusing on operational efficiency. So not only CapEx, but also OPEX, uh, we will have systems available and in place to support you. And also what I can tell you is that what we have really done is that we have taken all our advanced technologies from other ship types, what you could say similar, uh, it's maybe a little bit strong comparison, but what you see from Formula One coming into the personal car, this is uh, being a little bit high on the, on the edge here, this is what we are trying or we have done actually uh, taking the uh, advanced technology into the dry cargo 
shipping segment as well. This is at least uh, our goal uh, to demonstrate for you in the future. And uh, with these words, I will uh, kindly hand over the, the, the word to, to Ethan and talking about shaft generators. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is uh, Ethan Xiong speaking. In Chinese, my name is uh, Xiong Lingfeng. I'm the local sales manager for passenger and offshore vessels. I'm also the head of our technical support team. I'm sitting in Shanghai and I joined ABB in 2005. Uh, it means that I have worked in ABB over 15 years. So today I will walk you through the shaft generator hybrid system for cargo vessels. Shaft generator refers to the electrical machine collected with the main propulsion engine in order to operate as a generator, so-called PTO, or as a motor for additional power boost, PTI, or take me home. ABB shaft generator can also drive thruster motors, collect uh, the power from shore to ship, or collect uh, DC power sources or other, or other DC power consumers. And the drive itself could be low voltage or medium voltage. Uh, the benefits due to the use of the drive, so it will allow for wider speed range operation of the main, main engine instead of running only at the fixed speed and due to the use of the main engine to produce the electrical power instead of the auxiliary engine, you can get fuel saving. And especially with the two-stroke engines, you get much more uh, fuel saving out of the two-stroke engine. With the taking me home capability, you can increase the safety of the vessel. By using the same drive, you can also have the short to ship collection at 50 or 60 Hertz. Uh, due to the use of the PTO shaft generator, so sometimes you can lower your installed auxiliary engine power or even amount. The final target is to reduce the emission, of course. If we look at the configurations uh, by installation method, there are mainly two types, without gearbox or with gearbox. The biggest difference is actually for the machine. Without the gearbox, you can use the low speed machine. But uh, if you have a gearbox, you can actually use high or medium speed machine. The functions that you can achieve by different installation method is the same. The drive type is also the same. Uh, the machine, uh, some slight difference. For the slow speed, you can, you can always use synchronous or permanent magnet machine. For the high or medium speed, you can, besides the synchronous permanent magnet, you can also use the induction machines. The classic operation modes, which I believe is quite familiar to you, the PTO mode, meaning you take the power from the engine to the grid, uh, PTI, PTH, you can either do the boost for the main shaft, or you can use take me home, function when you lose the engine. The short to ship, as I said, you can use the same drive to provide collection to power the to power from shore to ship. Uh, you can also do uninterruptible power transfer between auxiliary generator and the shore power. Struster control, which we think this is the most economical way to drive an additional struster with speed control. Here you see more advanced operation modes, uh, integration of batteries. On the left side, the single line diagram, I think you will see or you may have seen for, for some time or maybe in the near future is the called hybrid system, AC and DC. On the right side, you see the generators, AC generators, they are connected to the AC switch board we uh, provide power for the AC consumers. For the shaft generator, which is based on a multi-drive concept, there you can collect the shaft generator to the shaft generator drive. You can collect the thruster motor to the same DC bus of the shaft generator drive. And most importantly, 
you can connect the battery to the same DC bus of the drive. And the battery here, you can use it either for spilling reserve or use it for peak shaving. For the engines, you can even do the zero emission when you, when you are in harbor to provide power for the hotel output. Uh, on the right side, which you see, this is ABB's next generation power system platform, which highly customized for the simple, uh, from the simple to the most demanding applications enable simply simple, flexible, functional integration of energy source and loads. Compared to the left side single line diagram, you see that the generators are collected through a rectifier into the DC bus of the multi drive system. And uh, due to the use of the rectifier or diode, the generator can run at variable speed. This means that when the generators are loaded at a lower level, of uh, at at the lower lower level, you can see you can still achieve a higher efficiency by just simply lower the RPM of the engine. Uh, most importantly, this uh, DC grid system you can collect whatever or what kind of uh, DC source into the system. Uh, so actually, this is uh, this is a, a system that we prepared for the future. When the collecting loads in a network is not linear, as does not always sinusoidal currents, the load currents will distort the sinusoidal voltages. This deviation from a sinusoidal voltage or current waveform is called harmonic distortion. And in our case, due to the use of frequency converter for shaft generator, it will cause harmonic distortion to the network. And this is common as long as the frequency converter is used. ABB has a long experience in electric propulsion system where harmonic distortion is always a topic. When we design the shaft generator drive system, the component selection and system configuration has been made so that the harmonic distortion to the network is as low as possible. Not to mention if there are other non-linear loads connected to the same network, ABB will provide THD analysis for the total system. A typical three-phase sinusoidal power supply is balanced and symmetrical under normal conditions. That is, the vector sum of the three-phase always equals zero. Thus, it is normal that the neutral is at zero voltages. However, this is not the case with a PWM switched three phase power supply where a DC voltage is converted into the three phase voltages, which resulting the neutral point voltage is not zero. This voltage is defined as a common mode voltage source. If a common mode voltage or current couples to equipment with inadequate immunity, there will be problems by using an isolation transformer has proven to be the best method to eliminate the common mode current. However, the system can also run without the need of an isolation transformer if the power system is designed properly with no sensitive nodes collected or equipment itself collected with some adequate immunity. Now we will, uh, I will shortly introduce about the system components. The first component is the ACS-880 liquid cool drives. ACS-880 is ABB's latest industrial drive designed to tackle any of the motor drive applications in any industry with power range up to six megawatts. ACS-880 is developed based on earlier ACS-800 drives. The most significant improvement is that the inverter output current has increased by 48%, meaning that space and weight saving will be achieved at the installation site. The drive itself has a highly efficient cooling concept. The direct, the, uh, it directly cools the liquid uh, through the modules, but indirectly uh, liquid cools the cabinet components. So by doing this, the cabinet can be totally enclosed, uh, which means that the heat 
uh, heat transfer can be done very easily uh, to achieve that 98% of the total losses goes to liquid, only 2% goes to the air, meaning that you don't need to have air condition devices or air ducts for your room. So it's quite ideally for the harsh environments and with very low noise levels. But just to mention that uh, we still have air cooled version for ACS 880 in case you want an air cooled version for your application. Another good feature about ACS 880 is that the system is designed with a three phase module concept. <laughs> Compared to the single phase module design, the converter can be in service with derating if one module has failed. This is uh, some kind of inherent redundancy you could achieve by ACS 880. <coughs> Sorry. We designed the system with IGBT plus. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I catch a cold today. We designed a system with IGPT plus IGPT structure, meaning that you can the rectify and the inverter modules are exactly the same and, and, and can be interchanged. This structure can this structure of having IGPT on both ends, meaning the power can flow either from grid to the shaft generator or from shaft generator to the grid meaning that you can realize PTO and PDI functions without obstacles. <laughs> ABB has a very standard range for the low slow speed shaft generators from 1120 to 2500 frame size. And the machine are designed according to IC standards and all the major class societies. The IP degree it can achieve to highest to IP44. Uh, it's a standard. It's a standard with a lot of uh, three phase, uh, a lot of uh, different accessories, including the PTM100 anti condensation heater, water leakage, water leakage detector, water warm and uh, cold air auxiliary tour box, internal vanish and uh, Organ free cabling. This is just to let you know that we have uh, this uh, huge application knowledge from different designs. I believe that mo many of you may get to know ABB from ABB generators and motors. This also indicates that uh, ABB do have a long experience for uh, for the generator and the motor application the shell generator has been uh, has been or maybe new in this market but actually from the technology point of view point of view it is not new we have done the design for different different applications in different industry segments What you see right now is our latest uh, generation permanent magnet shaft generator. ABB has uh, over 30 years of experience in permanent magnet shaft generator. And the most famous uh, permanent, permanent magnet application in ABB is the Azipod proportion, which we have delivered over, over 500 pieces for the compact data bots. The permanent magnet shaft generator from ABB is new, but technically it is not. Uh, what you see right now, the, the power range for the permanent magnet application is up to four megawatt. The torque range up to 570 uh, thousand Newton meters, which corresponds to a speed range from 30 to 80 RPM. The voltage level could be low voltage or medium voltage. Frame size, which is the, also equals to the shaft height, is 1.4 meters. 
technology highlights, as I said, ABB has uh, a lot of experience for the permanent magnet application. This is also developed along with the magnetic, magnetic material development from ferritite to samarium, cobalt, and recently neodymium. ABB has a patent magnet module solutions, optimized the magnetic geometry to ensure efficiency and reliability. ABB magnetic modules could achieve maximum protection against corrosion, no demagnetization at fault situation. The design is also done together with the converter to ensure full electrical system compatibility. Widening and insulation system. Just to mention here, even for the low voltage machines, we have the same form wood windings, which is normally used only in high voltage machines. And this technology has proven since 1970s. Uh, yeah. The vacuum pressure impregnation is also standard. We have also F-class high efficiency and high reliability. Okay, in the end, I just uh, summarize our performance until April 2021. <clears throat> we have delivered six vessels for DFDS, Roro vessels. We have uh, two <coughs> shadow tanker projects uh, running now in Korea, to another shadow tanker for Star, Star Oil in Korea, four VLCC just uh, signed in Korea from Samsung shipyard, Maroon, two Mobi ferries, one Bonhom Ropex, and five other vessel types. Uh, here I just selected some reference for your better understanding. This is the one from Bonhom uh, Ropex, delivered on 2017 where we delivered 1.6 megawatt PTO generator, low voltage synchronous type. And this is the DFDS, six vessels, two 2.5 megawatt low voltage synchronous machines, ACS, ACS 880 low voltage drive. Uh, Mobi, two 2.5 megawatt ACS 880 low voltage drive PTO. Uh, this one, I want to spend a few more words because I believe this is the future of this kind of application. Even though it's not a dry cargo, it's for shadow tanker. But I believe from technology point of view, it will uh, shift from, from the shadow tanker to the dry cargo market. It is actually built based on ABB onboard DC, DC grid concept meaning that the generators are connected to the DC link through the dedicated rectifier. The shell generator is also connected to the same DC bus of the, of the, shell, generator, of the shell generator drive. It's also based on the low voltage permanent magnet uh, machine. Uh, this one, similar but a little bit different, is uh, because it's built on AC grid. It's the AC hybrid concept. Uh, this one we signed just now uh, for Maran, 1.4 megawatt PTO permanent magnet application for AC grid. Okay, I think I will hand over to Mati. This is my introduction. If you have any questions, you can you can write down on the on the chat box. We can answer you later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Very interesting topic there. And uh, my, I uh, greetings from Helsinki, Finland. Matti Nuttila speaking here. And, and can we have the next slide, please? Okay, the um, topic is about transshipment uh, vessels or transloaders. Transmitment shuttle vessel, or let's say in bulk cargo business, uh, <clears throat> it is most feasible to use the, 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 the biggest possible vessel to transport the, the cargo, but this creates sometimes the limitations that these big vessels cannot enter the in import or export 
all the places where the, the raw materials or the, the cargo is, is, is available. And therefore, then uh, there has been a develop or transshipment vessels, and they are called transshipment shuttle vessels since the distance is rather uh, short from the bigger vessel to the port. And, and, so. and normally, these kind of transshipment shuttle vessels, they have also self-unloading, what we call SUL means that either cranes or, or conveyors or both of those. Next slide, please. This is describing the typical uh, scenario of the TSV or transshipment shuttle vessel. That the gray vessel on the right side, lower side, is the larger cape size bulker, uh, like a 180,000 dead weight ton and similar. And then also it, it is a rather big vessel, almost 300 meter long, and then needs water under the keel 18.3 meters when loaded, fully loaded. And then uh, on the left side, then there is a, a jetty, like uh, in, in export case, that the, we can see that the water depth in the jetty is just less than 10 meters. And this larger vessel cannot simply enter the, enter the jetty. And therefore, then we use this kind of transshipment shuttle vessel TSVs, which has the cranes on board so they can uh, self load. And then they have also conveyor belt system uh, built under the, the, the cargo bay area so that they can also unload by themselves and uh, typically also this kind of transshipment shuttle vessel the distance what they are is, is just a 10 to 20 nautical miles so very very short and, and so next slide please here we can see then in the left side of the picture is the large cape size bulker and the, the difference also with the draft that the, it needs this 18 meters water and then Typically, this kind of TSV transshipment shuttle vessel, we are less than 10 meters. Uh, this vessel, uh, uh, what I've shown in the picture, is uh, six meters, the, 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 the draft. And we can see also that the, the vessel has a uh, support propulsion system, two steerable thrusters in the aft, and then two bow thrusters in, in the fore, so that it's a very agile vessel, very, very, very good handling, and, and it doesn't need any tucks for daily business. And, and so. And uh, typically, uh, this uh, daily daily business is that the, the number one, the vessel transloader uh, loads itself with the own cranes. Now two times lever this kind of grab cranes, and and uh, puts the cargo in the it's in the own hopper. And then, then uh, phase number two, it uses the propulsion and system and do this ten to twenty miles um, uh, to the to the port. And then uh, number three, then we do the unloading with the, this time a sea loop conveyor system there. And, and, and so, so this is the daily business. And uh, we use the thrusters, Asipod thrusters, uh, steerable thrusters, 360 degrees without any limitations there. And, and it's uh, with the nozzle so that we can boost the bollard pull and, and, and also with the electric steering so that uh, we use only the energy when the steering is needed. And, uh, so. Next slide, please. Uh, if you can click, there's a one minute, one minute video prepared by our customer and showing the, showing the best. So two Ozipods, two boat thrusters, and then the gravity loaded uh, discharging system. And typically the larger vessel comes to the vicinity and we come with the, the, without the uh, tux to, to do the unloading. And unloading capacity is like, um, or self-loading is about 2,500 tons with the two grains, so that it's a quite a speedy process. And then, uh, uh, yeah. then next 
slide, please. Then what is ABB scope here is that uh, we have uh, given the, the low voltage main switchboard, 690 volts, 60 hertz with the four generators this time. Then also shore connection. And now this case, the shore power is 50 cycles, 50 hertz. So that, the, and we use uh, one of the propulsion uh, multipurpose frequency converters as as uh, conversion uh, uh, frequency conversion from 50 to 60, 60 cycles. And then also these uh, propulsion uh, converters are uh, what we call multi 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 drive that they 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 also feed the bolt thrusters and then also the unloading apparatus the conveyor belt system. And as I mentioned, we have two ossipods, give the uh, very very agile and and, and uh, handy handy vessel without any ducts and 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 also two bolt thrusters, and then do distribution transformers to do. Then further from 690 volts to 400 volts or so lower lower voltages for the for the ship own consumers. Okay, next slide, please. I go a little bit through the, the daily routines, how the vessel operates, and and here is uh, what we call operation mode en route. That we have uh, the asipot thrusters are uh, operational and they consume some some uh, four megawatts totally two times. Two megawatts, and we have uh, two generators online, which provide the uh, power to 690 uh, network, and then also ship uh, ship uh, own consumption is somewhere between 250 to 650 kilowatts uh, and with, uh, with the transform. And next slide, please. Okay, this is the moment that uh, we are entering next to the. Uh, big vessel or to the harbor, so that uh, I call it dynamic positioning, but uh, we have the two uh, thrusters uh, online, but then also we put the, the both thrusters in operation and and, and both thrusters consume about uh, two times 100 kilowatts. And then when we are doing the maneuvering, we don't take the full power out of the asipot, uh, so approximately two times 1000 kilowatts there. And then also the ship own consumption, between this 250, 650, depending on the consuming. And we can manage this with the two generators on. Next slide. Then here we have now, we have uh, got the uh, cargo on, on and we coming to the shore and we start to do the unloading. And this time the customer requested that, that this unloading has to be done on shore power. So we arranged about one megawatt, 1000 kilowatt shore power which is a 50 hertz uh, frequency. And we feed that the shore power to the, to the left side propulsion multi-drive. And since this is an AC, ACS uh, active front end IGPT technology drive, it, we can feed the power also to upstream towards the, the main switchboard. And, and also here, before the ACS 880 drive, uh, it's a 50 hertz, uh, frequency and then we convert it to DC and then further regenerate 60 Hertz, which is the main switchboard uh, frequency here. And then we are the main switchboard. We feed the, the right side propulsion transfer, uh, propulsion drive and, and uh, then uh, use this drive to feed the unloading uh, conveyor belt system. It has about uh, seven pieces of electric motors, which needs to be run in a certain synchronous and harmonic uh, manner in order to unload, be able to unload this uh, bulk car. And no, no diesels are running here so that we don't generate any emissions uh, on, on board. We, we rely on the short power. And next slide. And then uh, this is the operation mode number four. We are out in the sea next to the bigger vessel. And we have uh, only one generator running and we are feeding power to the two these uh, uh, grab cranes, two times 650 kilowatts, so 1.3 megawatt there, and then also we energize the the, the um, ship own consumption is 250, 650 kilowatts, and only one generator is needed here. And next slide. And then I want to summarize now the novelties what we offered here in in this vessel that uh, we could organize the shore power frequency conversion. 50 to 60 by using this active front end uh, 
ACS 880LV drives. And also the, the, the propulsion uh, variable frequency drive is this uh, also feeds the unloading system. It serves this uh, shore power feed and also boat raster feed. And, and of course the, the Ossipod propulsion, which I mentioned that it's, uh, it's um, electrical steering. It doesn't have any gearboxes and, and doesn't therefore needs less uh, lubrication on board. And not typically these kind of transloader vessels operate in a quite a remote areas and, and getting any services on board uh, is, is rather difficult. And then the owner uh, insisted that this has to be a very reliable system. And, and in Ossipod, we don't have any gearboxes. So this is meaning that it's uh, robust and less risky, plus giving a high efficiency. And uh, I want to, this is the end of my story. Next slide, please. Hello, everybody. So, my name is Sami Kanepas. Uh, I've been at ABB for more than 10 years and as, as well in, with some other, other businesses as well. Uh, for example, wind power and power utilities. I've been now, now developing the fuel cell solutions for, for marine for a few years now. So, next slide, please. So, this is the an overview of, of the of the regulations and uh, at the moment and, and we, we are now seeing clear shift that we, we've had had this sulfur and nitrogen oxide and, and particle emission limits and regulations but it's now clearly turning towards greenhouse gas emissions thanks please but but uh, in, in comparison to the regulations where actually public opinion is even running faster in the transition. So people really are uh, uh, concerned about the environment and climate change, and they are expecting companies to take actions even faster than the, than the regulations will, will, will take into the force. Next. In order to really get there, uh, if you have a target for carbon-free shipping, uh, there is a transition needed, and, and that means that the fuel or the energy source has to be transformed into into uh, renewable fuels. But also, we need some changes in the technology. And ABB is is now now uh, already quite far with the shore connection and battery systems, and, and already tested some fuel cell modules on board. And now we are together with Ballard developing the megawatt scale fuel cell solutions. And we are looking into also higher power, high temperature fuel cell solutions in the future, uh, future for instance, solid oxide. And this is uh, the technology that enables us to use also these new alternative fuels. As the next slide will, will show about this, these fuels. Uh, when we are turning the fossil fuels into renewables, our first step naturally are the biofuels, which can be blended directly and used in, in, in combustion engines in the same way as the fossils. But uh, in order to really cover the whole, whole need of, for, for the shipping, uh, we need the renewable alternatives. And that is practically built on hydrogen, meaning that, that we have a renewable electricity which is used to produce hydrogen, and we can combine it with the carbon dioxide, uh, uh, either captured from atmosphere or some industrial plants, and, and, uh, and then we, we are able to produce synthetic fuels out of the hydrogen. But we also have an option to use the hydrogen directly as a fuel, either in combustion engines or uh, bringing into the fuel cells uh, into the ships. Next. Uh, this is uh, uh, showing showing ABB's uh, way to to support really really the, this uh, carbon carbon free uh, solutions. And it, the backbone of everything is is really the electric power plant that uh, that enables to integrate the electric propulsion with energy storage and also fuel cell solutions and, and shore connection to build a hybrid power plant. The next slide it shows an example of a hybrid 
power plant in a vessel. Uh, or actually, this is a, a slide about the onboard D secret. Uh, next, next one is a, is the hybrid power plant. But then anyway, the onboard D secret uh, is, is our solution to enable a variable speed operation and, and uh, integration of the energy storage and fuel cells and other alternative energy sources in a very flexible way. Now we'll get to the, the hybrid power plant slide. Yes, so so it, it, it's basically showing this is now now an example of, of a fuel cell electric power plant. We could as well have a, have a have diesel generators as well. It, it wouldn't make a big difference. So it shows that in the center we have the, the power distribution system, the DC grid lineup uh, that, that is, is, is com combining the electric propulsion, the power distribution, uh, shore connection, battery systems, and also fuel cell systems all together uh, very nicely at the same, same, same lineup and enables really flexible pow uh, power management uh, between the different power sources and, and, and the propulsion. Then next, please. We take a look, uh, brief look into the battery systems. So the reasons why to go for batteries are basically uh, it's improving, or uh, it enables to improve the fuel efficiency and reduce the emissions. It also gives a possibility for a zero emission operation uh, in, in a short short range. And of course, it has some value in, in, in the branding uh, towards public opinion and, and, uh, and gives better availability for the systems while it can act as a, as a, as a backup. And the next slide is to show, just to remind that this, although these battery systems are quite new in Marie, uh, they are already state of the art. So, so there, are, there are hundreds of ships already being equipped with batteries, either in full electric or hybrid applications. Next, we can take a quick look into the functionality of the storage, what we can use them for. Uh, the, for instance, the spinning reserve option enables to, to operate the ship uh, with, with less engines running. If we need an engine for a backup, we can, we can replace that by a battery system that would act as a spinning reserve. And, and that's, that's uh, improving the, the efficiency typically for, for, the, for, the, for the ship operation. And then we can use battery for peak shaving in a, in a with variable loading. And so it's also allowing to us to, us to limit the, the engine loading and, run, and, and the transients to, so that the battery will take care of that, those uh, short-term peaks. And we can also enhance the dynamic performance of the, of, of the system by batteries, because batteries are reacting very fast to the, to the transients. Uh, we, can, we can ride through faults through batteries and use them also in a strategic way to, to design uh, how to operate the engines in the, in the ship and, and, uh, and planning uh, on, on the route and, and power system operation. And then it also enables the full zero emission operation for a short term. But uh, if we want to really get into the zero emission operation, uh, we might need uh, the fuel cells to support the batteries, as we see in the next slide. So when we are bringing the fuel cells into the picture, uh, th th then it allows us to, to have much longer distance uh, operations with, with a zero emission, considering that the hydrogen or the fuel, uh, or the fuel cell is, is uh, produced uh, in, in a by zero zero emission electricity. So the the typical use of of uh, fuel cells in the ships is a hybrid plant supported by batteries, so that we we can 
so the fuel cells can operate give the base load and, and, uh, and we can we can have the battery to to take care of the peak loading or, or the fast transient loading so it enables a nice and smooth operation for fuel cells and also we can maybe maybe uh, have a dimensioning for, for a bit lower load and then use, it, use the batteries for shorter peaks and this dimensioning between the battery and fuel cells is always case dependent that, that, uh, and based on the operational profile of the vessel what would be the correct sizing of the battery system and the fuel cell system so that it can be optimized completely uh, on both in capex and OPEX for the fuel. And then next. We change, yes, now it's coming. So the fuel cell itself, it is a uh, The basic operational principle is, is that it will get hydrogen and, and oxygen from the two sides of the fuel cell. And it will, uh, the, the reaction between these, these, uh, these substances cause electricity, heat, and water. And we will then, then uh, connect the electricity into the ship network, and, and the water will come out as an exhaust. And, and the heat will be transferred to the cooling system, or uh, it can be also utilized with, with heat recovery. And uh, at the moment, the, the most uh, useful fuel cell technology is the proton exchange membrane technology, PEM, uh, because that, that has been uh, used for quite a long time in, in automotive and heavy transport. And it, it, is, it is very mature uh, technology and also has a long, long lifetime moment but we are also looking looking at at the this new uh, high temperature fuel cell technology for it as high temperature chem fuel cell or solid oxide fuel cells so the benefit with these these technologies is that because of the higher temperature operating temperature they 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 can be used for for heat recovery and, and that will improve the, the total efficiency and they are also able to operate at at uh, multiple fuels, so they don't necessarily need need pure hydrogen to operate, but they could as as well be designed for for uh, methane or methanol or ammonia, for instance. Then next, please. Uh, the, the efficiency of the fuel cells is typically higher than the efficiency of a combustion engine. And that also, uh, uh, as, as well, the, the maintenance is, is uh, the need for maintenance is quite low because of, uh, of the static nature of the fuel cells. There are much less static or moving components. But uh, clearly, in the marine use, the benefit of the fuel cell is, is that it has very high efficiency also at low loading. So, so even if the operational profile is, is, is uh, varying a lot, the, the efficiency of the fuel cell remains uh, stable. And next, uh, we'll uh, take a look into a very quick look into the, the options to store fuel in for the fuel cell systems. So, if we consider that the, the primary fuel is hydrogen, we have uh, basically three options to, to get the hydrogen on board. So the most simple one is the, the compressed storage of hydrogen. It is a it is a the low cost solution and can be stored in a container and then swapping the containers will provide a simple simple buffering for the vessels. But the down, downside the disadvantage is that it will take quite a lot of space compared to conventional fuels. Then the improved version uh, would be the li liquid hydrogen store storage. So when it means that the hydrogen is cooled down to, to a very low, or we could say extremely low temperature, and, and, and put the liquid with the cryogenic system, the technology of a, a liquid hydrogen is, is uh, similar or, or almost the same as uh, LNG. 
uh, but but the temperature is lower, so it, it, is, it takes a bit more uh, energy and care of to, to keep the hydrogen liquid. But it's also existing a known, very well known technology and also being applied to Maria already in some, some pioneering countries. And, and, the, and the, the space efficiency is much better than that compressed time. But then uh, there are also solutions to actually reform or crack the, the hydrogen on board. So we would have a, have a reformer combined with fuel cells. Uh, there are also some solutions existing for, for, for that one. Uh, for instance, methanol. If methanol is the primary fuel, then it, it will be reformed to hydrogen used in the fuel cells. And, and also there are solutions for for uh, reforming hydrogen from natural gas or cracking ammonia. But next, uh, we will uh, take a look into the fuel cell solutions that are actually developed and offered by ABB as part of our, our power system. So, uh, small scale systems uh, where we will typically operate below one megawatt or, or maybe up to a few megawatts uh, would be built on, uh, on, on uh, it's, uh, commercially available. Marine fuel cell cabinets. We have an example here of, of a butler 200 kilowatt cabinet. That, and, uh, we can, we can, uh, these cabinets will contain the fuel cells and also the balance of plant, uh, the auxiliary components required to operate the fuel cells. And then we can connect them by, by cables to the uh, ABD stripe systems. Integrated with the with the automation and safety systems, having these cabinets next to each other, uh, they can be multiplied to higher powers, even even in the range of a few megawatts. But uh, in the longer term development, we 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 are ABB and Ballard power systems have a we have joined our forces and and, and we are running a development project on a megawatt scale fuel cell generation unit, where uh, there's an example of the three megawatt production unit that, that also contains the fuel cells and, and the balance of plant in, in, a, in a way that it can be safely, safely installed uh, even inside the vessel, or it could be uh, also placed uh, Packaged so that it would, could be placed on, on, on deck. The sizing of this, this uh, unit is, is about a bit less than two 40 foot containers in, in parallel. So the length of the of the best uh, of this unit is, is uh, about the same as the length of a 40 foot container. The width is, is uh, about 3.5, 3.6 meters. So we could take a slot of two containers, leaving some space space uh, for, from from the sides but uh, but as well it can be installed in a, in, a, in a engine room or, or some other machinery space at the best. the next slide uh, is showing some some facts on the fuel cell stack uh, of Ballard and, and and also explaining why we have a selective opera cooperate with Ballard on this uh, megawatt scale development uh, you have this uh, uh, Ballard has op operated already uh, 40 years with fuel cells and ha has a, a really strong experience and background and also production cap capacity for, for fuel cells and, and has clearly the highest quality fuel cells in the market for, for heavy heavy duty applications. And, and, and they, they, they have a, a already eighth generation of stack Cell stack uh, in market, and, and, and this uh, they have a, a recycling methods and also also develop methods to, to really uh, take all the valuable extract all the valuable metals from the fuel cell stacks when, when they are degraded and then build, re, rebuild the stacks 
with up upgraded membranes and, and then let's then bring the stacks stacks back to life again. And we are we are designing so the systems in a way that that when when the fuel cell stacks have degraded the level that it's it's uh, it's time to replace them, these stacks will be replaced only. So the unit the big unit itself uh, can stay and, and all the auxiliary components will continue operation. But it's it's the replacement of the stack is just a simple maintenance operation so that can can be be taken care of without taking the ship in, in the dry dock. And next slide uh, it's uh, describing the, the safety design in, in our megawatt scale solution. So because there are not not really regulations uh, in place yet for, for marrying uh, fuel cell solutions with hydrogen. We have had to, to start uh, designing the concept uh, from, from the basics, uh, including the safe. So it, it has started with uh, identifying the, the potential hazards in a hazard workshop and then turning, turning the results uh, and, and means to mitigate any risks you know, identified in safe design principles that have been followed in, in the design, and then adding also a lot of instrumentation and different safety functions to the system. And now we are in the stage that, that we, we have uh, documented all these features and, and safety features and design. We are in, in uh, quite close to, to have the approval in principle from, uh, from PNB class so, so we are in the final stage of the process so that they will assess ABD's valor solution and give their feedback and and, and, uh, and probably quite soon we would receive a certificate about the approval in principle for our solution. Then next is we'll uh, eventually take a look into a bit a different Vessel pipes that we see, foresee that that, that would use uh, would uh, get, be the first movers towards the hydrogen fuel cell solutions. And now, now uh, the, the 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 first step would be these small coastal and inland waterway vessels, vessels which would have a fuel cell power plant, like like uh, car ferries or fast passenger vessels, and also some tugs and, and even super yachts. But we are already uh, getting to the second phase, so we see uh, lots of growing interest in, in the in the row row and row packs vessels, and also some uh, smaller feeder container vessels or offshore vessels, so, and and also some some smaller bulk carriers. So it is already now the time when we see that these uh, these uh, small smallest vessels uh, are being already turned into a bit larger and, and including the cargo cargo vessels and, and then the next step when 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 we are establishing the technology and also the markets in, into this mid-sized uh, short, uh, short distance vessels uh, the, the next step would be really to enter the large vessels and that's why we are developing the megawatt scale unit already now so within uh, Two years we would have a, have offering also for larger vessels. That that would also include some larger bulk carriers or even container vessels. And when when discussing some uh, even the uh, overseas vessels, then then we would consider probably some different fuels, for instance, ammonia or synthetic methane, and then. Then, then we would we could potentially uh, benefit of, of this high temperature, like solid oxide fuel cell solutions. When take, looking at the next slide, it is an independent uh, analysis made by Hydrogen Euro. It's, it's uh, comparing different types of zero carbon or carbon neutral fuels for, for different kinds of vessels. And it, 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 it has uh, the alternatives are, are pure hydrogen, but also 
ammonia or synthetic LNG or methane or other hydrocarbons. And, and it's, it's uh, trying to assess all the costs related to life. Optimizing that what would be the lowest cost, the most economical selection of fuel in the different kinds of vessels. And, and when we get from smallest to largest vessels uh, in terms of distance between bunkering or the, the maximum propulsion power, uh, it can be practically split in three groups. That the smallest vessels uh, would have the most economical solution, fuel would be the compressed hydrogen. And then on the mid range, uh, the most common economical solution would be the liquid hydrogen. And then on the largest end, uh, economical solution for the carbon neutral fuel would be green ammonia. Uh, and, th and this is uh, also quite well in line with what we what we have seen in our fuel cell markets is, is that the uh, and, and so that the small and mid mid sized vessels would, would benefit of of the PEM fuel cell technology. But then when we get to the large larger end of a vessel, then we would either continue to operate on on uh, combustion engines, but but also consider these high temperature fuel cells that are are uh, uh, maybe in the market after a few years from now. And then uh, getting closer to the, to the end of the presentation. So next slide, please. Yes, uh, there are a few uh, examples of the of the of the projects that are being being planned at the moment uh, on on the hydrogen production. Because even when we get to the uh, green ammonia, the basic building block. Of, of, of part is, is really the, the green hydrogen. And there are lots of, of uh, uh, projects under consideration now uh, which are bringing the production of green hydrogen into ports. But it's really seen that they, the ports are the location for, for this couple of different sectors, uh, both the industry but also transport, uh, the truck transport or the, the marine transport. So it's very natural place that to, to invest on these large hydrogen production plants and, and possibly also then other plants to produce the synthetic fuels like ammonia or, or synthetic energy. So it is uh, showing some real progress here also on the fuel production side. Then next uh, is, is uh, just to show that as well, these, these uh, fuel cell shifts are already being designed and built. They are they are the smaller smaller end uh, range of the vessels, but we are really getting step by step towards the large. And then finally, at the ending slide, uh, which is reminding us that, that we we truly believe that also the dry cargo segment would soon be electric digital connect. Thank you very much, Sami, uh, and all. Then uh, uh, I think we can all go live and then we can uh, continue to Q&A. Uh, and everybody and all um, spectators, all viewers, uh, join us. Uh, please, um, we proceed to the chat now. So uh, we are open for all kinds of questions you may have. So um, let's see what happens. We might have also have been so lucky that we have been able to explain everything to the detail. So uh, <laughs> let's see. Hey, there are already two questions in the Q and A, Michael. Um, so we can start with this one. It says uh, existing vessel engine room might not allow geared shaft generator configuration. Do you have any comments to that? Ex existing. Once again, the question. Sorry. Existing vessel engine room yeah, might not yeah. allow geared shaft generator configuration. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Um, I guess the question is. Uh, it's popping up. Or what we see and uh, what we hear from our colleagues in service also that that um, 
uh, that in order to comply with these uh, exe rules and so on, uh, at least that is one of the explanations. Then it comes up for actually um, coming up with solutions for for shaft generator on existing vessels, and that poses a number, of course, of uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, you have to to see as it is being uh, pointed out, where is the space enough? Secondly, um, uh, of course, uh, you have to look into what, what, what is the engine able to set up uh, to carry out that uh, capacity or that uh, new um, installation. Of course, you also have to do some electrical uh, corrections and so on. So yes, it's it's a bigger job when you talk about existing vessels, and for sure, space is one of them. Um, but this, of course, is something that has to to go into with with the shipyard and the and a, and a consultant, and in this case, or whatever is is, is needed. Uh, but of course, we can assist in order to calculate the electrical uh, challenges and uh, possibilities uh, and supply the the overall system. But but of course, there are some mechanical things to look into and some things related to the engine and space. I don't know. Yeah, if any yeah. of my colleagues have a comment, yeah. Yeah, yeah Martin Utla here. Also, the propeller shaft line has been uh, day one designed with a certain torque and power, and now we introduce one element on the propeller shaft. So, major major change for the propeller shaft, and then maybe also the propeller working condition, because now the shaft generator takes a certain amount of power. That uh, it, it is a major operation. Maybe sometimes it's not even doable. Okay, technically we can do anything, but does it make a commercial sense? Uh, this is a different story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Uh, it says, and I understand for the new built vessel, planning and implementation of the fuel cell is possible. Is it feasible for existing vessels? If yes, what kind of reduction in carbon emissions can we expect? I see that a three megawatt unit can replace three megawatt auxiliary engine. So for a 350 meter vessel, uh, maybe a part C load can be replaced, considering the C load of the vessel is 10 megawatts. Yeah, possibly this is uh, uh, for me. And, and uh, yes, uh, it is it is feasible for existing vessels as well. Of course, it, it may uh, take some uh, some modifications in the routing of of the air, and and then of course the fuel fuel question. Uh, the fuel storage or, or processing must be solved, but but if we think of this uh, three megawatt unit, for instance, uh, it is quite nicely shaped, so it is uh, it fits uh, uh, in in a, in a between between the decks and 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 it's a rectangular shape. So so uh, finding finding space and nice location for that unit is uh, should should be feasible. So then the the what what may cause some difficulties is then that if if uh, there is another fuel needed, so if the main fuel of the of the, the ship is is uh, some uh, heavy fuel oil or or LNG, uh, then uh, that we would need to bring in the, the hydrogen storage as well. So so then operating with two fuels could be could be a challenge. But but basically the the fuel cell itself uh, could be as well. Uh, feasible for existing vessels, and it could be also also uh, located on deck in in a, in a sort of a containerized solution. So that's also an option. Thank you, Sami. Uh, there is another question: When are AVB Ballard expecting to be ready to deliver 10 to 20 megawatt fuel cell installations? Uh, at the moment, uh, our concept is is uh, quite complete. So, as as mentioned, that the approval in principle is is soon soon there, and then we would see that it is sort of a pre-check that it would fulfill the the requirements. And and our next step would be to start a, a pilot project, uh, uh, possibly, and then then that would take take uh, around two years to complete that that piloting, and that that, that pilot. Would be typically maybe three or six megawatt. It could be as well the ten megawatt system. But then we expect that 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 uh, even even after one or two years, we we could be able to 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 really 
close the deal, deal on, 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 uh, on uh, 10 or more the megawatt system. Sami, I think uh, as far as I can see, that is all the questions that have come in. If anyone has any additional questions, uh, you can put them either in the chat or in the Q&A. It looks like uh, there are no more questions uh, coming in. Okay. Do you want to uh, yeah. finish off? Yeah, well, of course, uh, just a final uh, final words here. I want to thank everybody, um, all pa participants, uh, all panel uh, participants, and of course, all the listeners and all our customers who have attended today. Thank you very much. And uh, if you want to go more into detail in the various subjects, uh, then uh, we are all four of us and the rest of the team in ABB, we are ready to answer your questions. And you can put them uh, individual to my colleagues uh, and myself, or if you have any doubts, you can always uh, put them to me. So uh, thank you very much to everybody involved and uh, participating and uh, have a fantastic nice day. I hope you have the same weather as we have in Scandinavia, which is fantastic sunshine and a very interesting football game tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you.